time here, would like to take the opportunity to welcome you. Uh, we also have a gift for you. So if you'll take the connection card on the back of your chair and you'll fill it out and take it to the Welcome Center after service, um, we have a gift that we'd like to bless you with as our way of saying thanks for being here. So you should have gotten an orange welcome bag. If not, you'll get one of those too because we made some more up. Um, if you've joined us this morning, we are starting a new series for uh, the next six weeks called This Is Us. And we're going to be talking about the family of God, the church family, uh, what are we founded on, what do we want to be, what do we want to be known for. And so that's what we're going to be looking at over the next six weeks. Today we're going to be talking about grace. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. That's going to be the opening text this morning. I do have a lot of scriptures And so if you want all of those scriptures, if you can't write them down, download our app, Severn Christian Church, and uh, and you'll be able to follow along with the outline if you click on Sunday morning and then notes, and you can see it's all right there. So anyways, so family life can be tough. Dude, being a parent is hard. I am, I'm just tired all the time. I mean, I don't get a chance. Parents, you know what I'm talking about, right? My son is almost five months old, and I was up at 4.30 this morning, which is great. And so I got to feed him, couldn't go back to sleep, of course, so I just looked over my sermon. Um, but, uh, but I'm just tired all the time. Like, it just, I never stop being tired. And, uh, and my little daughter is probably the worst because it's like they will just respond to each other. She'll hear him wake up and cry, and she'll start screaming out randomly. I'm like, what is wrong with my two-year-old? She's like possessed or something like that. And I go into her, and I console her, and they just go back and forth. And I like, I get no sleep. And the most troubling thing about having two children is you can never, like, tag team the other person in. So one parent's got to go to one kid. The next parent's got to go to the other kid. And I'm just like, dude, I just want to go away for a week and just sleep. Well, my little daughter, Piper, she's two years old. And she's a little rascal because she kind of takes after me. And, uh, yeah, you all know that. And so what Piper likes to do is before she'll play with her toys or whatever, she actually likes to take books. And she'll just flip through the pages. We'll put a movie on for her. She's got this little stand. She'll grab one of her books, and she'll just flip through the pages, touch the corners, flip, close it, and do it all over again. Well, one distinct day, I noticed that my daughter Piper has one of my books, okay? She's got her books, and I have my books, and my books are in my bedroom. I have just a few down there where it, which, okay, it's in reaching stage of her anyways. So I actually really do like my books, okay? I don't want them damaged. I don't want them crinkled. I don't want them ripped. I don't want anything that my daughter is getting ready to do to my book be done to them. So sure enough, I see she's got one of my books. As soon as I see it, I run right up to her and I say, no, daddy's book, not yours. And I take it from her and I put it back in my bedroom. Next thing I know, the next day, I come out, this little rotten stinker went in and got my book again. And it's even worse, okay? She's creasing the pages as she's turning them for fun. And I immediately, my initial response, I was angry. I was like, Piper, no, what is wrong with you? Didn't you hear me last time? My book, not yours, not nice. I take it back from her and put it back in. Well, it even got worse. I, I'm, I'm not, I am not making this up, okay? Next day, I come out. There's a crinkled up page on the ground. Somehow, she's got water that she's poured on it. Part of the cover's been ripped. And I'm like ready to lose my mind over this $15 book, okay? Look, I, we get it. So, uh, of course, I run up to her. This time, unfortunately, I have to spank her butt. So I spank her, grab my book, take it back. And this book is basically... It's not worthless, but it's, it's really damaged. And it really, really bothers me, okay? It really bothers me. So it's like this 500, it's, it's so random. It's a 500-page book about Mao. I'm like, why would you choose that book? You know what I mean? Like, go after another one. Not this huge, nice book that I just read. It's called Mao. He's uh, Mao Tsung. He's a, uh, uh, he was a communist leader in China. He's a terrible guy. And so let me have some insight to what co- communism never works. At least at the end of the day, that's what she can take from it, right? Teach your kids young. Communism never works. So anyways, so next time, sure enough, she's got a book, but this time it's not that book. It's another book. I'm not really that kind of a weirdo, okay? But this one's on Stalin, who was another communist leader. I just, I just wanted to read it. Like, if I'm going to criticize it, at least I should know about it, right? So I've got this another 500-page book about Stalin. And she looks at me before I can even say anything, and she smiles. She gives me that Ricky, that rotten Ricky smile that I had. And she rips a page as she looks at me and smiles. 
and I am like ready to get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not just going to get one spanking, you're going to get multiple. But I didn't. I didn't spank her. I didn't get angry, despite me feeling really terrible. Um, And so I went up to her, and I gave her a hug, and I said, whose book do you have? And she giggles, and she said some gibberish because she can't really talk clearly right now. And I'm like, that's Daddy's book. Can I have it back, please? And she hands it over to me, and I take it back and put it in my bedroom. And so we have this constant battle in the Bonifield household of Piper going after Daddy's books. But it was in that moment that I extended to Piper what's called grace, unmerited favor. That's, that's how you can understand grace. Grace is a gift that you do not deserve. If you think of it like this, sometimes I like to think of grace like this. Grace is a gift that you do not deserve that enables a person to do something good. And it was in this moment where I wanted to discipline my daughter. She did do something wrong, after all, and the right thing would be to correct her. But instead, I extended to her grace. And here at Severed Christian Church, we want to be a family church where everyone matters. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree. That doesn't mean everyone always gets their way. That means that we are committed to each other despite our mistakes, despite our imperfections. I'd like to read to you Ephesians chapter 2 to talk about this first aspect of grace. Grace is the foundation of our salvation. And this is what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. He says, he's writing to the Christian church, by the way, okay? So these are people who have already become Christians. And he's reminding them in verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so here Paul gives us probably one of the most popular and one of the most powerful passages of Scripture that establishes the foundation of our salvation is based on the grace of God. A lot of people don't know this, maybe you do, but you can approach God through two different ways or through two different systems. System number one is called the law system. You can approach God on the basis of your own deeds or how you respond to God through the law code that he has given you. And so, for instance, if you were a Jew and you wanted to be saved through the Mosaic law, you would have to keep all 600 plus laws. What you were doing is you were saying, God, I present myself before you on the basis of my own deeds and response to the law that you have given me. Here's the problem. If you break the law, you suffer the penalty. The good news is if you keep the law, you get the reward. But the whole gospel, right, the whole New Testament is emphatic on this one issue. Every single person in this room has made a mistake. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so if you decide to approach God on the basis of your good deeds, you can't measure up. So that only leaves the other system, the other way that we can approach God, and that is through the system of faith. Faith. Your salvation through faith is based on this wonderful, most beautiful uh, decision of God to extend grace to us. And if we are under grace, we appeal to God on the basis of what he has done for us, what he is willing to give us, and what we can't do or deserve or earn on our own. And so if you can think it like this, if you approach, think of it like this, if you approach God under the system of grace, if you break the law, you don't suffer the penalty but you get the reward. And hopefully in your own mind, you're thinking, well, that's not fair. And that's exactly right. Grace is not fair. Piper deserved to be disciplined for doing something that I told her not to do, but I extended to her grace. We do deserve to be disciplined for the things that we have done towards God through our sin, but God has reached out to us and has saved us, and he's willing to save us through this system that we call grace. When we understand works, I think one of the biggest problems we get into when people try to understand this passage of Scripture is they define works as anything that you do, right? A work is anything that you do, and that's not how Paul used works in this sense. Paul used works in this sense, anything that you do in response to the law of God. So even though we have faith and we place our trust in Jesus, just because that's something that we do doesn't mean that that's a work in response to the law code. The same thing with repentance. Just because we turn away from our sin and we repent of our sin doesn't mean that we are performing a work. And I would contend and argue that that is the same truth of baptism. 
And we'll get into that uh, idea a little bit later. But right now, we're focusing on this idea that we are not saved by our obedience to law codes because it is grace that truly sets us free. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 20 on the screen with me. Uh, This is how Paul puts it in another passage of Scripture. He says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. You see, when you approach God on the basis of the law, what the law's job is is to point out where you've gone wrong. And so you stand before God on your own basis and your own deeds, and the law is saying, here's where you've made a mistake. Here's where you've sinned. Here's where you've messed up. Here's where you've fallen short. And you can see how that's a big problem. Because God is holy and is just, and he does have to punish sin. But Paul goes on with this. This is probably, I would argue, one of the greatest verses in the Bible um, that we could ever have. It's in Romans 3, 24 and 23. And Paul says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But look at this. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says you've been saved by grace. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says that you've been justified by grace. And we're not going to get into this really big, fancy term of justification, so hopefully you don't tune me out. But justification simply means this. You're standing before God as the judge. You've got the prosecuting attorney who's condemning you, and you've got the defense attorney, Jesus Christ, who's excusing you. And God looks at you through the lens of his son, Jesus, and he slams down the gavel, and he says, not guilty, no penalty for you. That's what it means to be justified by God's grace. And so I want you to picture yourself before God as a Christian. And the prosecuting attorney has brought up all your sins, but all God can hear and see is the righteousness of his son. And he says, not guilty, no penalty for you. Grace is the foundation of our salvation. But grace is more than that. Grace is the foundation of our faith. You see, faith is having the right attitude about God. Faith is having the right attitude about God. And faith has two elements, okay? Bear with me, because we're doing some theology that's going to build to the impact of our life, okay? So, so bear with me through some of this theology, but it is really good stuff that will enable you to do good, I promise you. Faith has two elements. Faith that justifies. First of all, assent. Assent is intellectual judgment. It is a belief that something is true. And so a person yields this assent in Jesus Christ because of the sufficiency of evidence. Look, I am a Christian, not because I have blind faith, not because my faith is something that I can't see. I have faith because of the evidence of the resurrection. I believe in the things that I don't see because of what I do see and the evidence that I have. I believe in Jesus Christ because of the resurrection. I believe in Jesus Christ because of the inspired word of God. I believe in Jesus Christ because of the fulfillment of prophecy in scripture. There are a lot of good, rational, objective reasons why I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's an element of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 puts it like this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This is the other element of faith, is trust. Trust is the commitment of one whole self. It is the surrender of yourself and to the control of someone else. You know, one of the scariest things to do for me as a parent is to hire a babysitter parents, you're with me, right? I mean, you really don't know what kind of people are out there. You don't know what kind of person that you're hiring. And so you want references, you want background checks. I mean, you want the works, okay? What have you done before with children? And that's kind of a really scary thing. I mean, you're taking your child, the most important and precious thing to you, and you are entrusting that to the care of somebody else. I had teenagers, right, in the youth ministry. You know what the most important thing to them was? Their video game system. And they didn't trust me with it. I was like, hey, man, can I borrow your video game system for the overnighter? They're like, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, look, if anything breaks, the church will buy it. We'll replace it for free. No big deal, okay? I promise you. They're like, nah, I just don't, I just don't know. I don't trust it, okay? I don't even want to go there. So imagine, maybe you don't have kids, maybe you do, but imagine the thing that is most important to you and entrusting that to the care of someone else. A key phrase that I would focus in on is this. 
Assent is believing that certain statements are true, while trust is believing in a person. Paul put it like this. Right before Paul was getting ready to die, he wrote a few epistles. He wrote 2 Timothy was one of those. Uh, Paul was going to be beheaded in Rome for being a Christian. And Paul says, he's talking about following Jesus. He says, this is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Paul says, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my salvation. I have given myself over to you. I don't deserve this grace. I am totally undeserving, but I trust in you as my savior. If you could picture it like this, I am a huge scaredy pants when it comes to heights, okay? I'm like three feet up on one of those wall climbing things that you can go to like the, you know, what's that store called? Uh, Bass Pro Shop, and my legs are shaking. I do not do heights, okay? Not my thing. Call me, sissy, if you want to, but I don't care. Not going up there, okay? Unless I'm like duct taped in and strapped in. That's just me. So imagine, okay, imagine walking across a tightrope. You see those nutcases that do that? They walk across big things like a a big, gigantic, I don't even know what I'm saying, but you know what I'm saying. So imagine the Niagara Falls, a big hole. (laughs) I'm sorry, I apologize if you're first time here. So imagine those guys who walk across that tightrope, right? And you've seen this person do it a thousand times. And I can look at a person like that, and I can say, I believe that you can do it again. I believe that. That is ascent. Trust is getting in the wheel bucket and letting him push you across. No thanks, not going to happen for me, okay? Because I do not trust you, but I trust God. And that's what we all have to do. Sure, we can believe facts about Jesus. Sure, we can even believe in the resurrection. But if we haven't committed our whole self to the Lord and trusted him with every aspect of our life, Can we honestly say that we have justifying, saving, biblical faith? If we can't trust God, we can't please him. And so while faith is the foundational uh, condition for our salvation, here's what I would contend. Faith is not a sufficient condition for our salvation. It is not enough just to believe in certain things. But that belief must lead you to trust. And so if faith is the right attitude towards God, A trusting person will have the right attitude towards their sin. And that's what repentance is. When you are a repentant individual, you will look at your sin and you will hate it. Oh, you will make mistakes. You will mess up. You will not be perfect. There's no doubt about that. But you will look at the sin in your life and you will say, I hate that. I want to get rid of it. Repentance is not about confession. When I ask people, hey, define repentance for me, nine times out of ten they say, well, telling God your sins and admitting that you're wrong. And that's a little bit of an element. But repentance has to do more with your mindset and your allegiance. Who are you following? What are you following? What is sitting on the throne of your heart? And when it comes between that sin and God, what do you choose? So faith is a condition for salvation, but it's not a sufficient condition for salvation. We must be individuals who are willing to repent and turn away from our sins. If you can think of it like this, faith and repentance are like Siamese twins. They are inseparable. You can't get rid of it. And the Bible does say, unless you will repent, you will perish. And so we need to have the right attitude towards God. We need to have the right attitude towards sin. And our preaching of biblical grace, uh, we should really be emphatic on this point, okay? And a lot of people might ask this question. They asked it 2,000 years ago in the Bible, and they still ask it today. If God is willing to give me grace, does that give me a license to go sin and do whatever I want to do? Are you at liberty to leave this room knowing you are in grace and you're going to go out and you're going to commit a sin? Look at pornography. Cheat on your spouse. Spread a lie. Be greedy. Get drunk. Are we at liberty to go out and follow after these sins just because we're under grace? And the answer is no. You see, even though we're under grace, we're still obligated to follow God because he is our creator. God has given us commands that we are obligated to do. Here's what grace does. Grace changes how we view those commands. It's no longer, I got to go to church. It's no longer, I got to do this and I got to do that. But I get to do that. I get to follow God. That's the beauty of grace is it sets us free and it changes and circumcises our heart to where now we want to follow God. 
And so here's the question. And it was asked to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Paul says this, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So you ask the Apostle Paul, Paul, can I go on sinning because God's given me grace? And Paul would say this, how could you even think of such a thing? That's not how grace works. And if you believe that, if that's what you think, you don't understand grace. It hasn't penetrated your heart. You don't understand the condition and the nature of sin. There are a lot of intellectual truths about the Bible and about the nature of man that you don't get if you think that grace enables you to go out and have a license for sin. Paul goes on to put it in Romans 6, 15 like this. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. And so here's what I would encourage you to do this morning. In order to live a life motivated by grace, remember your baptism. If faith is the right attitude towards God and repentance is the right attitude towards sin, then baptism is the right attitude towards the promises of God. When we are baptized into Christ, we are meeting a necessary condition for salvation. Jesus says this in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And when we are immersed in water, we are telling God, God, I trust that what you told me is true and I relinquish myself to you. I commit myself to you. And so baptism is a necessary condition along with repentance and faith for salvation. That's what we are about. That's what we want to be. But even more than that, baptism is a little something more. I'd like to share with you Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 41. You've got the Apostle Peter preaching the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. And he delivers this dynamic message about how the nation of Israel crucified Jesus. Look what he says in verse 36 up on the screen. He says, Therefore, let all of the house of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now imagine if that was you. Wouldn't that make you feel sick to your stomach? I'm responsible for the death of Jesus? Look what happens in the next verse. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. They were sick to their stomachs. And they said this to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And look at this. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And so baptism is not just the time when you're saved or the occasion. Baptism is the point when you join God's family. Look what it says in verse 41. Those who had accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. God added them to the church. And so while faith is a foundation, or excuse me, grace is a foundation for our salvation, and grace is a foundation for our faith, we should understand and know that grace is the foundation for our family here at Seven Christian Church. If we are a church that appeals to law rather than grace, we are in big trouble. And you will notice this by judgmentalism, hypocrisy, mean-spiritedness, anger, fits of rage, constant division. That is a church that is founded on law. If that's the kind of attitude that we produce, we must be a church founded on grace. We have to be a church founded on grace. Otherwise, we've missed the most important part of the gospel. We had our son Knox several months ago, and when we found out, this is how I found out that Angel was pregnant, okay? I'm sitting out on the couch with Piper, and we're watching a show, and all of a sudden I hear from our bedroom, oh no, oh no! I immediately knew, okay? I immediately knew. It was not in our plan, as we like to put it. 
we wanted to wait three years, you know, Piper, three years old before we had our next kid. Otherwise, we knew we'd be exhausted, and here we are. But uh, I'm like, dude, Angel is pregnant. I know she is. And we had a lot of fear associated with that pregnancy. We were afraid because of the, the things that we experienced with Piper, the false positives and stuff like that. Most of you know, I'm not going to get into it or else I will cry. I'm not going there. But, um, but so we had a lot of fear associated with Knox, our son. We were wondering, is he going to be healthy? How are we going to manage his parents? Kids are expensive. I go through like 20 diapers a day. I'm like, this is ridiculous. You know what I mean? This is a scheme. And I'm just not putting a diaper on her. That would be even worse. But it is just like we had so much fear. But then when Knox came out, I mean, our hearts were just filled with love and gratitude towards God. And he was a part of us. He was a part of our family. I mean, we thought like, how could we love a second kid? And you parents who have more than two, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How could you possibly love someone more than your first child? But you do. It just connects and it works. And here is, here's Knox. He comes out and man, he is a part of our family. He hasn't had to do anything to merit or earn that. Piper is a part of our family, despite her trying to learn the difference between right and wrong. It's about being committed to them as a parent. And even though I have obligations as a father and as a husband, that doesn't negate my attitude and my feelings of love for my kids. And just because we're obligated to obey God doesn't negate God's grace and how he feels about us. And as a family, that's how we should feel about each other. I was raised in a small country Christian church, about 50 people on a good Sunday. And uh, often the preacher's wife would play the piano, and then he would lead the singing and then go into the sermon. And so we sang hymns. Like, it was, it was old school, okay? We're talking purple carpet, green, lime green pews. Uh, it was just awesome. And I go back and I look at that, and there's some good memories they have there. Well, one of the best hymns that we would sing, we would always sing after baptism, right? Somebody would get baptized, we would sing this hymn. I'm not going to sing it because I just don't want you to feel like you can't sing when you listen to me. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to read it off to you. Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So here's how the hymn goes. It says, From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God, I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm a part of the family, the family of God. And we would sing that after someone made a decision to follow Jesus and become a part of the family. And that's what we are. And look, I have hurt some people in this room, no doubt about that. I am not perfect. I make mistakes all the time, and I can promise you I'm going to make mistakes in the future. But what does that have to do with our commitment to each other as family? We might not always get along. We might not always agree. But the Bible talks about a familial commitment to each other. God's family. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. God says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This word handiwork is poema. It's where we get the word poem. We are God's story to the world, broken and desperate need of grace, sinful but yet saved. We are God's story to the world, and we are created to share that story. We are created to share ourselves with the people around us. And so if I could put it like this, our salvation is by grace, through faith and repentance, at the time of baptism, for good works. And that good work starts with how we treat each other. This is us. This is who we want to be. This is who we choose to be. This is going to be our story. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 puts it like this. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do good to all people, especially to the family of believers. Let me show you a few other scriptures up here. I gave you Galatians 6, 10, Ephesians 2, 9. We're called God's members of God's household. 1 Peter 2, 17, love the brotherhood. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, we're called sons and daughters of God. And so being a part of God's family doesn't mean we're going to be foolproof, but faithful to each other because we have a commitment. I know my kids are going to make mistakes. 
I know as their father, I am going to make mistakes. I know that my kids are going to have different opinions than me. We're going to get in fights. We're going to disagree. But at the end of the day, despite those mistakes, we are committed to each other because we are family. And so what's the hallmarks of a biblical family? Well, it's simply this. Grace is the foundation for our focus as a family, our focus as a church. And so what do grace-saturated, grace-filled, grace-saved churches do? Well, they do a few things. Number one, we've already talked about this, so I'm just going to briefly reference it. Those who have biblical faith. Faith Faith-focused, faith-based, grace-based families of God have biblical faith. And that's exactly what John says. We have the right to become children of God because we've placed our trust in Jesus Christ. Number two, those who have the apostles' doctrine. Paul goes on to say this, you are members of God's household, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So we are those who uphold the truth. That's what the family of God does. Yes, we have grace and mercy, but we also speak the truth in love. And we are going to be a church that's going to be committed to the truth of God's word. But thirdly, this is what we're going to end with and focus on is simply this. Those who live in love are those who have their focus on grace. Paul says in Galatians 5.13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Why would you even think that way? May it never be. Don't use your freedom as an excuse to go out and sin. Rather, what's the focus? What's the focus of a grace-based family? It is simply this, serving one another in love. You see, when you appeal to God under the law, you are saying this, how little can I do and still get by? Can I be a Christian and still get drunk? Can I be a Christian and still look at porn behind my wife's back? Can I be a Christian and still hate people in my heart and gossip and slander? What's the lowest amount that I can do? As long as I attend church on Sunday morning, I'm good, right? That's appealing to God through the law. And here's the danger of that. I'm not saying that those of you who have those feelings or are convicted by that or always feel as if you can never do enough are not saved people. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, is you are beginning a thought process that's going to take you down a very hurtful and self-damaging road. Because at the end of the day, if you keep going to God on the basis of I'm not good enough, I can't do enough, I'll never measure up, how little can I do, you will begin to appeal to God on the basis of the law and you will invalidate grace. You can only choose one system. The grace of God, which is created for good works, or the law of man, which says how little can I do and still get by. One's misery, the other is set free in freedom and in love. Becoming a husband and a father, it's one of the greatest honors that I could ever have. An angel gave me three wonderful gifts. The gift of her heart, the gift of her hand, and the gift of our home with our children. And while I'm not free of those obligations as a husband and a father, I do not view my role as a husband and as a father as some obligation that I have to do. And as long as I can just get by with just the lowest amount of fatherhood and being a husband, then I've done my due diligence. Wouldn't that be an awful marriage? Do you want that for your relationship? How little can I do and still technically be a husband or a father or a son or a daughter? That is misery. What's the same truth with God? We should be viewing our roles and our relationship with God with what more can I do? God has saved me by the free gift of grace. I want to do more. I'm going to do more. And I'm going to give people grace. As Christians, we perform good works because of God's grace, not for God's grace. And we do them in love. Jack Cottrell, he's one of our very well-respected theologians and what we call our brotherhood. He writes this, Wherever love exists, it expresses itself in act of service. Love cannot be passive. A grace-based church is going to serve one another in love, actively pursuing what can I do to serve God and serve each other. Now, how do you know if you're acting in love? Well, there's two questions I I want you to answer this morning. Number one, If you're acting in love, are you moved by misery? When you see other people hurting, when you see other people in need, are you moved by their misery? The Bible says in Romans 12, 9, that love must be sincere. In 1 John 3, 16, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers, our sisters, our family. 
If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and with truth. Our love is about sharing with God's people, but it is more than that. The Bible says in Romans 12, 20, that if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in a world, in a culture, in a nation that seems so divided by opposite sides and hate and division, we as Christians should not just love each other. That's where it starts. But we are to go out and love those who are considered our enemies. How do you respond to the misery of others? Do you respond with compassion and love? And number two, are you moved to mercy? This is probably one of the most important theological teachings for a Christian. Are you moved to mercy? Romans 12, 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. James makes this very clear in James 2, 13 when he says, For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. If you have lived your life never giving people mercy... You've got a rude awakening ahead of you. And there have been times in my life where I've been graceless and merciless, and God has disciplined me. You know how? By having people show me no grace and no mercy. And let me be honest with you, it doesn't feel very good. And I don't want to stand before the judgment seat of God. I don't want to stand before each of you and stand before you without grace and without mercy because I need and want mercy from God. The story that we're going to end with is the wicked servant I'm not going to read the whole thing. could do an entire message about it. But basically, you have this guy. It's told in a parable. And he owes the master an incredible debt. If you read through the story, scholars have calculated that he would have to work 160,000 years in order to repay this debt. It's impossible. It's just impossible. There's no way to repay that debt. And so the master comes to collect, and he says, I'm going to throw you and your wife and your children into prison. I'm selling you into slavery in order to pay back something of your debt. And this man falls down at the feet of the master, and he he throws himself upon the mercy. And God is the master. And he says, have mercy on me. Release this debt. I can't pay you back. I will try. I'll do everything I can. Just have mercy. And the Bible says this. In verse 27 of Matthew 18, And the Lord of that servant, being moved moved with compassion, released him and forgave him of all his debt. And that's what I think about for us. That's what God has done for us. He has looked at our incredible debt, and he has given us Jesus in exchange for our sins. And he's been moved with compassion, and he removes our debt. He releases it. He forgives us for it. It reminds me of Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, where it says, But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead, and transgressions, for it is by grace you have been saved. And so here's this servant, and he's set free. But what does he do in the story? He goes out, and he finds a servant of his own who owes him three months of debt. And he goes to him, and he says, he grabs him by the neck, and he says, you have to pay me, otherwise I'm going to throw you in prison. And he takes him, this merciless servant, and he throws him in prison. Well, the other servants of God hear about it, and so they go to the master And they're enraged, and they tell the master all that had happened. You know what the master does? He calls that forgiven servant back before him, and he calls him a wicked servant. This is what it says. You wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Remember, this is a parable. And this is how my heavenly father, Jesus says, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Grace is so important. Your forgiveness depends upon it. How you respond to God's grace, you either accept it for good works or you reject it and be your own master and your own roller. And I pray and hope that everybody in this church will be willing to give grace to each other forgiveness, mercy, love, service, compassion, a tender heart, because that's what ultimately sets us free.